With that, it gives me huge pleasure to welcome the Minister for External Relations, Senator Ian Gorst. so much technology up here, I'm not sure if I'm moving on to the incorrect slide. Um, thank you very much uh, indeed for your warm welcome. Uh, it's fair to say for uh, six and a half or seven years I've had to be very careful uh, about what I say at events like this. Uh, I've been finding over the last six or seven months I don't need to be quite as careful as I used to be. Uh, and Particularly, of course, this afternoon, I don't need to be careful at all uh, because I've already been thanked for what I'm going to say. <laughs> when Murray uh, invited me last year to come and speak at this lunch in uh, February, uh, despite his crystal ball, uh, it is fair to say that we didn't um, imagine uh, that this week would be quite as momentous as it is turning out to be. Uh, and we've still got two and a half working days left. So we know, of course, that the meaningful vote has now taken place. We know uh, that the division in the United Kingdom Parliament uh, is wide, uh, perhaps wider than the Prime Minister was hoping by the time that they got round to the um, vote, but it does seem that those with differing views, those with uh, differing wishes about Brexit are finding it difficult to come together uh, and put the national interest to the fore uh, and manage the Brexit process. So the vote has taken place. We now are facing a vote of no confidence. Um, those of you who have been watching the UK media uh, will be aware that the government um, is expecting to win that vote, but the shadow chancellor, um, as is his wont, of course, this morning, saying in the current state in Parliament, anything could happen. So what we do know is that there continues to be, uh, and perhaps as we get nearer to the Brexit date, uh, that is more difficult for us, continuing uncertainty about what Brexit means and, what, and how the government in the United Kingdom is going to deliver on the referendum result from 2016. And the rest of the world, and we see European commentators and European um, officials and elected officials themselves um, adding to some of that uncertainty. Uh, yesterday, we saw the reaction of United Kingdom businesses. We saw Amazon, Tesco, Balfour Beatty, and we also heard the Chancellor once more uh, saying that the protracted uncertainty around Brexit was doing damage to British business. And the difficulty uh, from our perspective seems to have been that there are such extreme claims being made on both sides of the argument that if the UK leaves with no deal, and we'll come on to that, some would have us uh, believe that it will be the sunny uplands and everything will be rosy in the UK economy uh, into the future. Others, uh, they've been accused of carrying out something called Project Fear, that if the UK uh, leaves even a little bit of the European Union, uh, then we are uh, all in disaster and everything will be terrible. Of course, um, being a politician myself, uh, I know that the truth in all of these arguments invariably lies somewhere in the middle. For us, 
of course, uh, I believe, and business investors and businesses have been saying to me, uh, that the stability that you offer in Jersey, the fact that you are out of the EU for uh, everything uh, other than goods, for our customs arrangement under Protocol 3, uh, gives them continuing confidence to invest here in uncertain times in the, um, in the UK. Uh, and I think that we have an opportunity as we get nearer and nearer to March and perhaps beyond, let's see, um, to continue to build on that and promote ourselves as a stable uh, jurisdiction where little actually in reality will change, but we'll come and talk about some of those areas. So in government, um, as you will be aware, uh, we started preparing for the referendum uh, result and we were able therefore to produce a strategy paper uh, within a couple of days of the referendum uh, result. We were one of the only places affected by Brexit to be able to um, do that. We have created a specific Brexit unit in the Ministry of External Relations. We've got six Brexit work streams um, right across government covering agriculture and fisheries, customs and trade, digital communications, financial services, immigration and transport. And we've added to that from July of uh, last year a contingency focused work stream. Uh, and they are working uh, with the Emergency Planning Office. The Emergency Planning Office is working right across the Channel Islands and, importantly, is working with the UK government as well. Uh, one of the perhaps unintended positive consequences of Brexit, of course, is uh, that we in Jersey government now have a far uh, closer and more uh, frequent working relationship with the United Kingdom government. And we have had to take time uh, and put resource into ensuring that many departments across the UK understand our constitutional position, understand what their responsibilities are uh, towards the islands, the, all three Crown dependencies actually, uh, and how uh, they have an obligation to take into consideration uh, what we wish to achieve throughout this process. And I believe that to date they have done just that. Um, that has meant that from a ministerial perspective there have been uh, far more telephone calls, far more uh, visits to and from London and from an officer's perspective they are in more than daily communication with their uh, counterparts in the departments across the UK. So that doesn't mean that these negotiations have been easy, it doesn't mean that the progress that we've, be, we've made here has been a foregone conclusion. But what it really does is pay tribute to uh, my officials and I will say something uh, more about that shortly. So right now as we speak there is a tabletop exercise taking uh, place at um, the TA Centre. Don't read anything into that. Um, <laughs> and that is an important governmental tool to um, understand how we would respond as a community to some of the uh, potential outcomes for a very narrow scenario, which is um, no deal on day one. I am very grateful for the work that Chamber and Jersey Business uh, have undertaken together with my officials to think about the implications of a no deal on day one to businesses, because as I've been saying all week, uh, government can only do so much, we can be prepared, but individuals also have to ensure that they are prepared if they are EU citizens currently, and we've created the Jersey EU Settlement Scheme to ensure that their EU citizens living here can have certainty about their future. But businesses also uh, need to be um, prepared. So we have um, made progress. And it is in no small part to a team effort. I'm 
very grateful to the, I think he's over here, to the Chief Minister who has offered his full support to all the work that we've been doing in the Ministry of External Relations. I'm grateful to my Assistant Minister, the uh, Constable of St Juan, so I think of him as my Constable. Um, I try not to talk to him about the rubbish collection. Uh, and I'm also grateful to the Deputy of St Martin who has, brings his vast experience in agriculture and fisheries and has been uh, invaluable in helping me uh, to think about those areas. Uh, but really it is the officials. Um, over the years, civil servants have been uh, criticised as pen pushers, um, a drain on the uh, public purse. But I have no hesitation in saying that I believe I have some of the brightest uh, and best minds in our island working on these matters in the Department for External Relations and right across the departments thinking um, about Brexit and they are of course um, ably uh, led uh, by the Chief Officer there, Kate Nutt. So, uh, some of the progress, we have signed a jersey or a um, Crown Dependencies UK customs arrangement. Uh, this was critical in ensuring that the ability that we have to move freely and trade freely with United Kingdom and our fellow Crown Dependencies was maintained, whatever the outcome uh, of Brexit was. Uh, and again, that took some negotiation, uh, but we got there and it's a very positive um, result for the Crown Dependencies um, uh, and our future. We've created, as I said, the Jersey EU Settlement Scheme, which uh, mirrors uh, the UK scheme. Um, that again will give certainty uh, to EU citizens who are currently living uh, here. That's incredibly important uh, because we hear a lot of negative narrative about migration and immigration. And some have said that one of the reasons for the decision in the United Kingdom uh, was a frustration with uh, population levels and migration. For my part, people who have come to choose uh, to come and live in our community and are committing to our community, we should welcome them with open arms. They add immense value to our community, not just financially, not just uh, filling the jobs that businesses have, but they make us a more diverse community, they make us a more culturally rich community. And I want to say to every uh, one of those citizens, you are welcome here, we would want you to stay. We are going to have to ask you to go through this uh, registration process. We understand that for some of you uh, that might be slightly frustrating, but please do so because that will give you certainty. In effect, it will give you that long-term right to uh, remain. You are part of our community. You are part of the Jersey of the future. And so we're pleased with that particular uh, piece of progress as well. Uh, we in Jersey, um, not that I should boast because I don't like to um, boast, but as they say, nobody else will do it for me. Um, we in Jersey had our withdrawal bill um, agreed and through the States Assembly um, in advance of the United Kingdom or any of the other Crown Dependencies. We refer to it as URAL. Uh, what that does is mean that we now have the legislative base for whatever type of Brexit happens, uh, we will at very short order be able to change our regulation and ensure that our laws function um, and we will be able to do that because of the way that we've uh, created the ability for ministerial orders uh, right up until the 29th of March. Um, CTA uh, remains in place. Uh, what that does is give certainty to business and to leisure travellers that we'll be able to continue to access the UK uh, without restrictive border um, control. So the entire focus, uh, it seems to me, of the media, not only uh, here in uh, Jersey, um, uh, but also across the United Kingdom, has been about what will happen if there is no deal uh, and the risks that might be uh, might arise uh, from that. We start from a very 
advantageous place. And that is that we are already outside of the EU for most um, purposes. Uh, that again is what gives us the stability uh, for the uh, bedrock of our economy, uh, which is financial services. They are already out. The EU already treats us as third countries. Um, sometimes there are disadvantages to that, but in this particular instance, that is a great advantage and it's one that we wish to build on into the future. Free trade uh, with the UK has, as I've said, been secured uh, through the customs union. Uh, that means that there will be no uh, friction added at the border with the UK should there be no deal. Um, of course, what it does mean is uh, that the EU would apply their external tariff to our goods that are exported to um, Europe. And I, earlier this week, perhaps I was a little bit too open uh, because it seems to have been picked up. Um, but it's important not to scaremonger, but it is important for us all to have the facts. So if the UK does leave without a deal, it is very likely that there will be some supply chain disruption. Do we need to be fearful of that? No, we don't. We have supply chain disruption every winter. <laughs> sometimes for one day, sometimes for two days, sometimes for three, sometimes for four. Of course we don't like it. Of course we get terribly excited on social media and we uh, think that Lyndon should do something about it. <laughs> But we are used to it. So even if there is no deal, and the planning assumption is that ironing out these difficulties may take between three and six months, that doesn't mean to say we're going to have supply chain disruption for three or six months. It means we're going to have it for short, potentially, and it's still an if, um, if you're an ardent um, lever on WTO terms, don't think I'm uh, saying things which are uncomfortable. Um, it's still an if, but if it does happen, it, it would most likely manifest itself in being two or three days at a time where a ferry or supply chain might be disrupted. We are preparing plans for it, but let's remember, as I've said, we are used to it year in year out anyway. Um, one of these potential disruptions, of course, to the supply chain is around border inspection. Uh, and Customs and Immigration have been doing um, great engagement with Jersey Business and with um, your officials at Chamber as well to help understand the potential for that and to help mitigate it. As I've said, we're prepared from a legislative perspective um, because we have URL as well. So today we've been launching, uh, together with Chamber, the Brexit Business Checklist. And it is a toolkit uh, which I hope will enable you as uh, business leaders, business owners, um, to use uh, to ensure that you as a business are prepared and it gives um, access to, there are paper copies outside uh, but actually you need to see the online copy because it sends and links through to any number of technical notices which we have compiled uh, together with the United Kingdom Government um, to give confidence, to give comfort uh, and to help understand what are required and it covers those areas of workforce, customs, trade, taxation, transport, regulation, compliance, uh, consumer rights, legal and uh, financial. And I, again, I'm extremely grateful, Murray, uh, for all the um, input of the Chamber and um, President and Vice President, uh, for all the engagement uh, of the Chamber in that particular piece of work. But it's not all doom and gloom, just in case you've got indigestion. There are, I believe, as I started off saying, many opportunities. Uh, let's recall that when we did the um, strategic uh, review with McKinsey, 
They then, three or so years ago, said to us uh, that we needed to maintain our relationship with the European uh, Union. We needed to uh, protect that relationship, but we also needed to look for new markets and new opportunities. Let's be clear, that's not just in financial services. That should be the mindset of all uh, businesses who are seeking to grow. And I've said it before, and I perhaps will upset my colleagues over the water, um, going international, uh, to my mind, is not opening an office in St. Peter Paul. Please do open an office in St. Peter Paul, but we must look uh, far wider in our geography and in our thinking. So it's going to be even more important that we in the Channel Islands make sure our voice is heard in Europe and in Brussels. We've got some great uh, officials in the Channel Islands Brussels office, um, CBO. Um, it does seem to me that civil servants like to uh, give things long names and then use uh, letters to try and describe them and confuse ministers, but that's another issue altogether. Um, like the UK, the likelihood is that we will have to put more resource into engaging with Brussels and the member states in Brussels into the future in light of the UK uh, leaving the EU. But the UK will be in exactly the same position. We are building and enhancing our bilateral relationships through Bion, uh, in Caen, uh, and growing that work up into Paris. Next week, um, I will be uh, half of the week in Paris and half of the week in Brussels doing exactly that. We're increasing the ambassadorial engagement via our London office uh, just before Christmas. And I had uh, extremely fruitful meetings with the French ambassador, the German ambassador, the Italian ambassador, um, the Maltese High Commissioner. I've got to get that right, haven't I? Um, so we're going to be doing more and more of that, as well as all the increased engagement in Westminster as well, and we'll come on to that. Uh, we'll be seeking inward visits as well from um, ambassadors and high commissioners uh, from not only member states from around the globe. On Monday, the Chief Minister and I hosted a lunch with the honorary consuls, and we found that that was very fruitful as well. So the engagement is going to need to increase. So rather than cutting ourselves off, uh, we need to ensure that we are more outward looking. You'll be aware that um, a few years ago we developed a global market strategy in government and we developed a global markets team. Uh, that was again in response to the McKinsey work. Never has that been uh, more important uh, and more strategically important than it is um, today, protect, promote and uh, pursue. Uh, we're developing and have received entrustments for uh, new international agreements. Two officials were in the UAE only last week, um, starting and uh, I hope largely finalising the new bilateral investment treaty with the UAE and they made fantastic um, progress. I will be, together with the uh, Chief Minister, making visits throughout 2019 uh, into our priority markets of Africa, China, India, uh, the Middle East, and working with Jersey Finance in the um, USA. But we're not just doing that on our own. Uh, we're doing it together with our partners. I'm pleased to see the Deputy of Grooville here. She is um, transforming the work that Jersey Overseas Aid does and uh, bringing to people's attention uh, that Jersey is more than just about money. Some of the really exciting uh, partnership work, work that they are doing in funding projects, taking the Jersey cow uh, and increasing yields in developing countries, helping financial inclusion with the very poorest and most vulnerable around the globe, taking uh, an expert the expertise that we have here in financial services and using our aid money uh, to work in partnership. So um, uh, it's not just
government yourselves in uh, chamber, digital Jersey, Jersey finance, Jersey business. If you want to hear more about these opportunities uh, for the future, then please come along um, on Friday. Uh, because all of those organisations will be talking more about the work that they are doing uh, into the uh, future uh, to deliver business, to deliver aid uh, and to transform the way that we are perceived uh, around the globe. We're very good at criticising each other. We're very good at being negative. We're very good at finding a problem. And we see those arguments in the United Kingdom, some of them becoming quite personal over the last number of um, weeks and months. And of course, we're having exactly that debate in the United Kingdom Parliament right now. I feel honoured. I feel <coughs> humbled. I feel proud to live in this community. And I think what's good about Jersey far, far outweighs some of the rightfully we have conversations about where we're going to put the hospital. Of course that's right. It's right that we should always strive to do better and challenge one another uh, to improve what we're doing. But we should never, ever forget what a great privilege it is to live here. What a great place it is in which to live. What a great heritage of stability, of navigating storms, of navigating challenges by the international community we have. Brexit, to my mind, is but another. Every business leader knows that in a challenge there is an opportunity. And I think that the stability that we have, the agility that we have being a small place, means that there will be difficulties as we go through this next period of uncertainty in Brexit. But we have plans in place. We are prepared for any and every eventuality. Let's have confidence in ourselves. Let's have confidence in our stability. It's been the key to our success for generations. And whilst politicians will come and go, while governments will come and go, I believe it's that stability it's that working together to navigate these difficulties that will mean that we, as an island community, can continue to be a success. Over tomorrow, whatever the outcome is this evening, beyond the 29th of March, or later, if the Brexit leaving gets delayed, we have everything to fight for. We have everything uh, to believe in ourselves for. So I thank you uh, very much for uh, listening. If you were hoping I was going to give you the inside track on what the UK is going to do with Brexit, I'm sorry. I've disappointed you. Um, but I think there is a time when, yes, we observe what's happening. We continue to communicate with them. But we have always been about forging our own path. And this is a time for us to continue to do that. Thank you very much indeed. Ian, of course, is happy to take questions around right about now, having made us feel a little bit happy. better. Happy? Happy. Never happy. happy. Um, so if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand and we'll, we'll make sure we get a microphone to you as quickly as we possibly can. So whilst you're thinking about that, tabletop contingency plans going on today. Another coincidence or did you, did you pull that together today? Or has that been in, in train for some time? Uh, that's always been part of our um, Ready Brex uh, week. 
Um, it's, as ever, um, trying to prepare for a potential outcome which is uncertain. It can be difficult to get people enthused about preparing, and I know that businesses find it the same. Um, I, the number of people who initially said to me, well, of course they're going to vote to stay, so why on earth are you um, employing people to prepare yourself for when they vote um, to leave? Well, okay, they voted to leave. And people have been saying in recent months, well, why are you preparing for no deal on day one? Of course there's going to be a deal. I, mean, I actually think there will be some sort of delay, deal or delay. Um, but I'll tell you what, um, if we don't prepare for it, and if businesses don't prepare for it, you would rightly be critical of me post-March. Um, and that's what I have to think about, putting us in, very, in the very best place. And that's why this contingency work is starting to ramp up, and we see that as a, in the um, tabletop exercise today. You know, you, you said there about um, deal or delay being the more likely. Is that just what you favour, or is that what you're getting back at the moment? Um. It's a, it's a good question. You asked me on Monday whether I was a Leaver or a Remainer, and then and you didn't. Know, and, and then, and and then the you didn't give me time to explore all the arguments. And for the benefit um, of that, so, Senator Gorse said he was a Remainer, but now would be a Leaver. No, I didn't. I said <laughs> voting. I said I said if I was voting in Jersey's national interest, living in Jersey, I would vote Remain. I said if I was living in the United Kingdom, it's a wholly different argument, and we didn't have time to go into all that. We um, no, we don't. <laughs> um, what did you ask me? <laughs> I can't remember that. <laughs> um, ju just, just in terms of that, we, I, I, it was about delay or deal. You feel that those are the more likely options? Well, the Prime Minister is very clear in saying that it was her deal or no deal. The Europeans have been very clear in saying uh, there is no other deal of this nature. Of this nature, we're talking about a bespoke type of deal. Um, of course, the Europeans have in the past said, yep, they would do a free trade deal along the Canadian lines, but I think we have to ignore the plus, plus, plus. It would be along the Canadian lines. We all know that doesn't include financial services. Um, or you then go to something like Norway, uh, where you remain very closely aligned with the EU, just not actually a member. So you pay the money, you have all the uh, freedoms that you abide by, but you're not in the room making the decisions. So they will have to be now explored. Is there time to explore all of these between now and Monday, when the Prime Minister has to come back with uh, Plan B? Um, it's unlikely, at which point you then start to get into simply you're running out of time. There's no majority in the House of Commons uh, to leave without a, a deal. You hear that day in and day out. That position has not changed. But as we stand here today, legally, unless some other statute is passed by the UK Parliament, they will be leaving at the end of March. Let's talk about food, because it's you know, close to my heart and maybe a few other people's as well. Um, in terms of supplies, you did say we're used to delays. We're used to those, the, the winterisation of our supplies, the fact that we get a, a few empty shelves every now and then because there's been a storm for two days, three days. But the what if is, if we have a storm for two or three days, if we have trucks backed up between Dover and Portsmouth trying to get down to us, not only do we have bad weather, we have delays on top of that. That could make it doubly difficult. So it's not just the same as, as winter, is it? Well, it's not the same as winter. Of course it's not, because it's... So, so, uh, so, so it's, it's, it's doubly it, it's, it's a change of a relationship between a country and a, uh, and a block. Um, well, of course, you know uh, from tabletop exercises that's exactly what they will be exploring. Uh, right now as we speak. So you have the issue of lorry storage at Portsmouth. Portsmouth, of course, is not the only uh, port on the south coast, so there's ongoing work with others. Um, there is great storage facilities by Jersey Aholias in uh, on the south coast. Um, so we ask, we are other, asking our... Um, which other ports? Well, we? I don't want to okay. say just too much. These are ongoing conversations and uh, negotiations, but I think you know. Um, 
they, they um, uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, we're working with the um, ferry uh, services. We're looking, uh, we're drilling down and looking at contingency plans. We're testing those contingency plans. Uh, we all know that we're fairly close to France. Uh, we, there are other contingency plans in place to try and mitigate uh, that multiple effect of uh, difficulties arising. If we were to get food in from France, which, as you point out, our closest neighbour, there are difficulties in labelling, there are difficulties for uh, retailers because they work on the northern route and not on the southern route. But have we got the legisl legislation changes in place that we could accept food getting into supermarkets and being labelled in French instead of English? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> and um, I can't give you a full uh, and definitive answer um, because I know that the um, it's not called economic development department anymore is it Mary since you left um, uh, but that that, um, <laughs> that department uh, this is part of their contingency plan and it's exactly these areas that they are working on it's more of an issue of course for medicines and supplies than it is for food stuff um, and that is being addressed as well. Okay. Uh, questions from the floor. There, there must. Be. If there's not, I'm going to keep going. So, okay. Let's talk about uh, the settlement scheme. Don't we? What? Thank you. There's one bag in the centre there. Um, I know you've got a great voice, Kevin, but we're going to get a microphone to you anyway. Fear that's a little bit um, unfair. If you have been to the events that we've been holding during the course of the week, where we've been going into uh, detail, we've published 100 technical notices um, already. So, this government can only be prepared so far. Individual businesses need to look at their own supply chain, need to talk to their uh, own ferry operators, need to talk to their uh, own customers um, along the lines that the uh, Brexit toolkit um, suggests and those technical notices. If you have um, specific issues uh, that you feel that are not being addressed in those technical notices, haven't been addressed um, during the course of this week, then please do come and talk to us uh, and we will endeavour to help you overcome any obstacles that you think remain in place. But if you're asking us to tell you what the outcome is actually going to be, um, well, of course, we can't do that. What's your favourite outcome? What do you think realistically is the focus of your table discussion this morning, this afternoon? Well, a tabletop exercise is a contingency planning exercise, so uh, you, know, you know that. People come into a room and they say, are oh, the ferries just lost an engine so it can't get its supply in? Um, ferry speed has had a fire in its warehouse. Um, it, it just builds up and builds up and builds up and you're testing all the time, testing, testing, testing. Um, and you see where the weaknesses are, when, then you ask yourself, can we mitigate those weaknesses in any way? Um, we do not live, I mean, you're in, we're in the context here of understanding we don't live in a perfect world, you can't mitigate every risk, you can only go um, so far. That's what government should be doing, and that's what we are doing, and that's what, why we are asking business to think about their own continuity and contingency plans. Uh, in light of a potential no deal on day one. So you're confident whatever the outcome is going to be? <coughs> confident that we can mitigate risk as far as we can? Yes, yes I am. 
one thing I'd like to say on behalf of other people here is, yeah, it's great to hear you thank you your team, who I know are working behind the scenes a hell of a lot to get the information you need. Um, I think we should all give them a big round of applause because they are working all sorts of hours. I do know that to support you, your team, and the rest of the government. But yes, please keep us in mind about what's going on. It's not lost. We're not lost children. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. If you've got any more questions, then please uh, do raise a hand and we'll, we'll get to you. In terms of settle, oh, what left? Andy, sorry. Hi, my name's Andy Cook. Um, I'm an ex-retailer, currently in pro. Just raising points around food. Um, it's a very simple observation. The island is serviced by a small number of large food retailers. I know we've got the smaller retailers, but they themselves get it from where, from wholesalers that themselves are part buying groups. When I read these articles and I hear comments, it's as though we actually buy something from some tomato from a supplier in Spain. We don't. We, almost all the retailers bought through very large UK companies, whether that's the Cooperative or Waitrose or Marks and Spencers or through Nisa buying groups and, and such like. I wonder whether um, government has, is, or will um, support those retailers to work with their UK supply, which might be the opposite UK is the supply of the Cold Jersey, Marks and Spencers UK is the supply of Rome, West Jersey, Waitrose, Ditto. It seems to me, my, my fear on food retail is that because there will be shortages going into the UK, they will seek to service their main stores. I'm an ex Marks and Spencer guy, I know when there's a shortage, Marble Arch gets the store, gets the goods and Jersey doesn't. That actually looks to me to be much more concerning than I think the island is well serviced with freight operators for all the criticism and I'm talking about across the board. Greece can say that, but I am talking about across the board. So I'm actually worried about how the UK um, regional distribution centres and top decisions are made to support our local stores. Is there engagement to the government with retailers to support their supply chain? Um, there is engagement uh, of government with retailers, and you, you make a very good point that um, there are things that government can do. Uh, so the official bit uh, with the Department for Transport, uh, with port authorities in, in the South Coast, with the local councils, with retailers here. But there's also very much an obligation on businesses to look at their own supply chain and ask those very questions uh, that you rightly raise. And if uh, there is an issue that's not just the normal day-to-day -day issue that you pointed out, um, that they wish for government to then become involved in, uh, I know that um, um, Lyndon's department will be only too happy to do so and to support those conversations if necessary. Thank you. Question right behind. Andy to Andrew. Hi, Andy. Um, Andrew Joseph, I'm happy with that. Um, Senator, um, excellent presentation, thank you very much. Um, you would have negotiated over several years a number of bilateral agreements already with other member states in the, in, in the EU. Will those uh, agreements remain in place if the UK finally leaves? Because you have spent many years negotiating those, because you have 30, 30 countries states already. But will they remain in place and be recognised by the EU when the UK eventually leaves the EU? Yeah, they, this is one of the points I was making about the fact that we are already recognised as third country um, and therefore they are existing bilateral arrangements that we undertook when we were a third country. We will remain to be a third country and therefore they in law stand. Question asked? Thank you. Um, you talked, and it wasn't lost on me, Ian, about... Um, Everybody is welcome, contributing to our community from wherever you come from. There is the necessity for a settlement scheme. 
The settlement scheme is for those that have been to Jersey before or been to Jersey and built up up to six months worth of time here and they can continue to do that for five years and during that time they will then get their full settled status. And for those who are EU nationals that live here, just by owning a house, just by running a business, just by having children, grandchildren here, they will need to go to that settlement scheme. What about those who've never been to Jersey, but might think on April the 1st that they would like to come? Now there will be employers in this room that may be employing those very people. The moment they can come and there isn't a process actually in place yet, that. You're questioning me about a very um, <coughs> detailed element of the uh, scheme which is run by Customs and Immigration. If I remember correctly, and I could be wrong on this, I think there is a window of opportunity. Uh, I'm not sure if it's six months or longer that they could come uh, and register, but there is the possibility down the line of um, connected relatives. Uh, to come as well and avail themselves of the settled status scheme. Just expanding on that point, and, and, and I, 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 I sympathise with the fact that it is quite a detailed question. Um, employers will be um, one week before Easter, a couple of weeks before Easter, March 29th. They will be employing seasonal workers they hope will be coming back, who may be racked with fear that they cannot come back. How are we going to get that message to those workers in other countries and presumably that's something that is being looked at at the moment with regard to seasonal workers because they are important to our economy. Yeah, and that's why we've had the engagement this week. It's why we met again with the honorary consuls on Monday. It's why customers and immigration have been doing a pop-up shop in the central market to make sure that awareness is broad and wide right across um, our community. We've printed um, documents in... Uh, different EU languages so it's more accessible but again employers who have employees right now who are EU citizens uh, it would be worth that in their contingency and um, planning documents to be, be uh, speaking to those employees making sure that they have the information and uh, helping facilitate the um, online registration form uh, in the United Kingdom some employers are actually paying um, the fee, even though it's double the Jersey fee. That's a cost of business, of course. That's right. I might want to ask you about the cost of business, but I've got a question right over on the, in the corner. They will. <laughs> Sorry, you, you, you could shout if you so wish. I'll give you a It's a practical question. Um, so it's one thing I don't understand. I appreciate that the so far the contingency planning focus is on short term disruption. It is exactly that. I mean, the point that I think you're uh, making is the point that um, Jacob Rees-Mogg would make and the ERG group have been making, uh, that there won't be any disruption because um, the supply chain won't be disrupted. Nobody will put up um, any friction either on the French or European border or on the UK border. Um, both are an assumption. Uh, which is why I very carefully have been using the words if. Uh, and it's that if uh, that we, it's very difficult to quantify, uh, but it is that if. You could say two adults uh, would pick up the phone and say we're just going to let them through. Uh, but there is an important issue of um, security at border. Uh, neither side is going to want to compromise that. There is then, if you're leaving... 
uh, will Europe uh, uh, straight away apply WTO um, tariffs? If there are going to be tariffs straight away, um, there's a whole host of administration that comes along with that. Is the UK going to uh, impose tariffs to ensure that um, their membership schedules, which are currently before the WTO and being reviewed, um, they won't want to do anything to harm that review uh, or impinge upon that review, so they may want to take that decision. It's a big if, and that's why it's important for us as a government uh, to plan, to think about these issues, uh, but equally uh, it's really important that we're not scaremongering, uh, we're not being silly about these things. Um, I, uh, forgive me if I've given the sense uh, that we're not all grown up in this room, uh, because that's not how I perceive it. I perceive that we all are, and we're having a grown up conversation about the ifs. Got one last question. We'll be sticking right at the centre there. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll get a microphone to you. Keep your hand up, Steve, so we can just follow it up. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ian. Thank you for your speech today. And uh, for introducing new topics in it, we've been listening to all of your, your speeches, so thank you for that. Does the government expect any kind of um, tariff inflation? Because if one assumes, um, as we've already said, you know, some of our tomatoes that we buy will be grown in Spain, they are likely to go into the UK, there will be a tariff on them. That tariff will, in the first instance, be picked up by the UK importer. But of course, the cost of that tariff will find its way to our market. Have we anticipated what kind of inflation that will be? Because if we're trading with the UK as our biggest trading partner now, I can't see that changing over much as we go forward. So the question is, do you anticipate any inflation based on tariff? Um, we, we, we haven't gone down and done economic assumption work around um, tariffs. Um, probably for the same <laughs> reason that the gentleman over here has just asked uh, that question, because there's lots of ifs. We know that the uh, WTO uh, tariffs that are talked about that might be fallen back on in some areas are minimal, in other areas could be um, quite substantial. We discussed, didn't we, earlier in the week, the new uh, CD UK customs arrangement and the joint committee that we have to um, consider those tariffs, albeit if you fall back on WTO terms, there's not much flexibility to consider any amendments to those um, tariffs at all. But there is a mechanism in place in that arrangement for us to sit down with the UK and to discuss those uh, particular issues. But equally, we've got to be mindful, as I say, WTO have their schedule of tariffs that get changed from time to time. Um, and we have to think about where our interests are aligned with the UK and where we might be able to consider exceptions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, that does conclude our question. In the time we have for questions, uh, I, I was going to ask if our civil servants are brilliant and I do understand that they're rightly being congratulated. They're probably worth an RBI pay rise, but that's probably a subject for them. Um, the Chief Minister's already left. The Chief Minister's already left. <laughs> No, we won't ask that now. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Ian Gordon.